I'm Francis McLone, a professor in neuroscience, and neuroscientists have a, have a passion to understand why things work uh, rather than just looking at the behaviour of, of an animal, for example. So we're kind of driven by mechanisms. Uh, and for some time now, I've been interested in a particular sensory system, uh, classified as the sense of touch, but the sense of touch is a bit of a misnomer because that sensory modality is far more complex than you'd even see in textbooks published today, in fact. So the skin that tells you has numbers of receptors that tell you, or your brain, about the events that are happening on the surface of your body. Uh, and they're quite, it's quite limited in its bandwidth, in fact, because the skin nerves that detect the senses that you experience through bodily uh, events are touch, temperature, pain, and itch. So within your skin, you have sensory systems, specific nerve fibers, that code for a mechanical stimulus, a thermal stimulus, what we call a nociceptive or painful stimulus, and a pruritic or itchy stimulus. And just as an aside, I won the Ig Nobel Prize for a project I did on itch, which was basically trying to identify which body part is most pleasant to scratch, and I'll leave you to ponder that one yourself. An interesting anatomical function of these nerve fibres, by the way, which is really critical to our research, is that there are two general classes. There are those that transmit information very quickly. Now, these are myelinated nerves. And myelin was an evolutionary process that enabled a nerve fibre to transmit information to the central nervous system really quickly. So if somebody touched you anywhere on your body, if a fly landed on your nose, you'd feel it immediately. Now that's the sense of touch that most people understand as touch. It's a fast conducting nerve fibre that basically allows you to know that something's touched you. Or even when playing a piano or handling tools, these receptors in the skin are, are enabling you to get a, a, a millisecond by millisecond update on what's happening on your body and, the, and what the sense of touch is providing for you. Now the other class of nerve fibres, which I've always found more interesting, are a class of nerve fibres called C fibres. <coughs> and C fibres are unmyelinated. Now the one thing about an unmyelinated nerve is that it can't serve any function of updating you in a second by second basis of what's going on in your body because they conduct information really slowly. Now the classic example of a slowly conducting C fibre is the nociceptor or pain nerve. Now this gets me to another point, by the way, in terms of that we have a fast pain system and a slow pain system. So if you've ever put your finger on a hot plate accidentally, inadvertently, the fast pain system will pull you immediately. So you'll pull back. If you're me, you'll probably swear. But that pain is just a pricking pain. It's not really emotionally laden. But if you've ever done that, a second or two later, you'll start feeling a burning, radiating, thumping pain that can go on for minutes or even longer. And the important thing about that second slow pain is it's emotionally laden. Yeah? You feel like crap. It's awful. You want to protect that body site. And that's what the nociceptor does. The nociceptor is evolved to basically protect the body from harm. And that's what it's there for. Now, the real key thing about our research over the last... 10 years since I arrived at John Moores, is we've identified with our Swedish colleagues another class of C-fibre that responds now not to itch, which is another C-fibre, not to pain, but this nerve fibre responds to gentle touch. Now this was only discovered in human skin in, in, about, about in the 1990s uh, by some Swedish neurophysiologists. They were using a technique called microneurography that we may be able to sort of talk a bit about later. But microneurography involved putting an electrode, a bit like a tongue, a bit like a, a acupuncture needle, into the skin, into an underlying nerve bundle, and listening in to various signals that are coming up that nerve fibre from these receptors in the skin, touch, temperature, pain. And that's how this nerve fibre that responds to slow, gentle touch was discovered uh, by an amazing uh, neurophysiologist called Orca Valbo. Uh, around about the 1990s. And this nerve fibre responds optimally. It was first found in the supraorbital nerve, which is a, which is a nerve fibre that feeds the, foot, the skin of the forehead. And this nerve fibre, a C fibre, and everyone would have thought, well, this C fibre, to make it, to make it uh, active, we're going to need to put a, you know, burn it or put a pin in it. Oh, no. This nerve fibre responded optimally to a gentle stroking touch. Now... <laughs> I was on an aeroplane flying out of Washington in about 1994, uh, reading Orca Valvo's paper, 
And it just dawned on me that this little sea fiber had a really profound role in many aspects of human behavior. It was the reward associated with close physical contact. Now at that stage in my career, I'd actually dropped out of academic research and got a, a job in Unilever research as a basic scientist. Uh, and the idea here was to use, build a neuroscience platform that would enable the company to understand more about how people use their products. Um, it took me a long time, actually months, to realise what I was doing there until I discovered that I'd stumbled into an absolute goldmine of opportunity because the group I, I had joined was an exploratory group. So the money that I could get my hands on was used for basic science that would provide some insight to the company in future. And uh, that's when I worked out that what that company made was the products that go in you or on you. So basically feeding and grooming. And on the basis of that, I built a massive research group, enormous external academic networks that basically enable us to understand just what it is about these sensory processes that govern these ubiquitous behaviours. All primates feed, all primates groom, and many of them forage as well. So you've got three basic primate behaviours, all of which I had access to as a scientist. And, and I just I was like a kid in a sweet shop. But the idea that I could look, work on touch, of course, was the fact that every product that somebody is using when they're grooming, they're touching themselves. No one's asked the question, well, why do they do it and why do they keep doing it? <laughs> and why do they like doing it with that particular product? And that's where this paper by Orca Valvo really jumped into my head because I was thinking about applications of what I was doing to justify <laughs> my, my career in industry because I felt a bit out of place, to tell you the truth. But because I joined this exploratory group, I could set up external networks that enabled us to actually understand what is it about effective touch, i.e. pleasant touch, and can we get at this nerve fibre and understand more about its properties. And that really has driven the last 20 years of my life, is characterising the functional properties of a nerve fibre in the skin that responds to gentle touch in a way that is outside the fast touch system. So we've got a fast pain system and a slow pain system. We now know we've got a fast touch system and a slow touch system. And this slow touch system we have becoming more and more interested in, in terms of its role in our mental health. And I think it's been obvious that the only good thing for us that's come out of this pandemic is that for the last two years, since March 2020, for the first time in human evolution, primates, human primates, were not allowed to touch each other. It's only that absence of touch that really opened up in people's minds just that something was missing from their lives. They didn't know about this nerve fibre, of course, but what they did know is that something is gone in the, in the lives that they had prior to COVID. I mean, how many times have we heard, I want a hug? How many times do we see the, 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 these images on television of, of people not being able to touch each other when, when they needed to console each other? This nerve fibre is at the root of that need, and it is the root of the benefit that was taken for granted previously that when it was removed, people's lives began to fall apart in a way that they hadn't really understood, and still don't, of course, because the neuroscience is still relatively new. But getting back to my earlier comment that we're interested in mechanisms, we now have a mechanism that we can look at to understand the impact of touch on people's mental health and well-being. And that has been the focus of this lab and our research group in, in, in what we call the Soma Effect Lab uh, for the last 10 or 20 years in learning more about this nerve fibre's functional properties, why it's there and what it does. And what we know from our own research on humans and animal research is that the activation of this nerve fibre has a number of direct effects that we can measure physiologically. It releases oxytocin, you know, the bonding hormone. It releases endogenous opiates in the brain, the reward transmitter. It lowers heart rate, it lowers cortisol, a measure of stress. So this touch, mediated through gentle touch, is having a direct impact on a whole range of homeostatic processes that all factor into our well-being. And that area now is becoming more and more recognised in the sense that we now have an international society that we set up four or five years ago uh, on effective touch. We hold international meetings every couple of years. More and more people are becoming aware that touch is far more important than they had previously given it credi credibility for. But we're fighting against this demonization of touch. You know, we're fighting against this 
this litigation about nobody can touch anybody, Every, everyone is p potentially you know, harmful to you. Uh, this is like denying people a vitamin that you know is good for their physical health by saying, oh, you can't take that. And we have the same kind of process with, with this nerve fibre in, in terms of touch, in that by denying touch, what our, evidence, our research is showing is that you're actually harming people's well-being. Now, I needed to find an experimental way in which we could prove the case that this nerve fibre was having the kind of benefits that the research in animals was showing in terms of how this would impact on human behaviour. And there are a couple of classic examples. I mean, the first one was the, the, the you know, seminal studies of Harry Harlow when he took infant monkeys away from their mothers at birth and gave them the opportunity to feed from a wire surrogate mother or to cling to a soft surrogate mother that had no reward associated with it in terms of food. And where that monkey would have, should have been possibly, was where all the, where all the fuel was. Um, but what Harlow observed is that that monkey spent most of its time clinging to this useless cloth surrogate. Now for me that was an indication that there's something about gentle soft touch that instinctively in that infant monkey drew its reward system to that cloth, to that cloth surrogate. Now because Harry Harlow had no idea of this nerve fiber, he came up with a number of theories of love and attachment, etc. But my view is that that infant monkey's behavior is driven by the fact that it has a nerve fiber in the skin that instinctively seeks out rewards of close physical contact. Stepping further forward to a human example, we see the Romanian orphanage babies that were discovered in the mid-1990s in Ceausescu, Romania. Thousands and thousands of babies in these orphanages, all of them showing severe signs of distress. They were fed and they were watered, but what, weren't they, what didn't they get? They didn't get touch. Only when these babies were, were, were sent to foster care did their behaviour begin to improve, where they began to get the normal interaction between a mother, a father and the child through touch. But again, none of these people knew at that stage that there was a mechanism that was responsible to some extent for these children's ab abnormal behaviour. Now that got me at thinking how can we demonstrate experimentally that this touch system is playing a fundamental role in early development. And that's where we decided to look at preterm infants. Now preterm infants when they're removed from the womb, the womb, obviously for reasons you know, for the mother's health and for the baby's health, when they're placed in an incubator, all of the efforts of the neonatologists uh, and care nurses is to keep that little tot alive. So there's concentration on temperature, make sure the gases are right, make sure the lungs are clean, make sure all these developmental markers are basically optimised. But there's something missing. Yeah? And what's missing in the incubator? is the gentle massaging touch that that baby will have been getting in utero. Now on the basis of that theory, a few years ago, Liverpool John Moore University set up a, a Dragon's Den type competition uh, for scientists that had sort of outstanding ideas. Uh, of which there were, there were many, and many good ones of course. Uh, I came up with this project I called Back in the Sack at SAC. The idea being that we would try and recreate the environment that the infant was in in utero in the incubator, hence back in the sack. So I was awarded £25,000 by the university, so I won it, by the way. <laughs> and with that money, we developed, with an engineer colleague of mine, we developed a mattress that would simulate the kind of stroking touch that the infant would have been experiencing when they were uh, in the womb. The idea here was to develop a system or a device, a medical device, which could be placed in the incubator we should provide, we, we, we replace the kind of stroking touch we are hypothesizing, or we know in fact that the infants are receiving in utero with the amniotic fluid washing over the baby and the baby moving against the womb wall. So we wanted to put that tactile environment, follow, follow the baby from the womb into the incubator. Now to that extent, what we've done now, we have a prototype system which took about a couple of years to develop. We went through a number of iterations on this. And what we now have with my colleague, uh, Chris Dancer, uh, we have, he has developed a system now. What happens with this mattress is that each of these tubes will basically deflate and inflate. And what it will do is it basically will transmit a standing wave of stroking touch up and down this mattress at the velocities we've already described of about three to five centimeters per second, which is what this nerve fiber is responsive to. 
we are hypothesizing that this system is, is engaged at the very early stages or very late stages of development in utero and there is much evidence to show that even babies at 12 to 18 weeks are, or fetuses at 12 to 18 weeks are responding to gentle touch. So we're quite confident this nerve fibre is operational in utero. So this device, which we call the gentle touch stimulator, controlled by this uh, device here, enables us to deliver gentle massaging touch to the infant, and we'll see this placed in the incubator, a baby basically placed on top of it, and what we're hoping to see, or hypothesising we will see, is indicators that this device in the babies that get the touch will manifest itself as significant improvements in, area, in aspects of their physiology and also epigenetically in terms of the expression of certain gene systems, particularly glucocorticoid and serotonin. We have data for already that this device is having that kind of impact. So we did one study in Italy in a neonatal intensive care unit on preterm babies where they were just stroked at three centimetres per second or just static touch. And that study showed clear indications of, um, of heart rate changes and, and blood oxygenation changes of a beneficial nature in those babies that got the gentle touch. So we've got some confidence that this system is going to have a very positive impact on, on the preterm babies development. Uh, so this uh, animatic here shows us this gentle touch nerve being stimulated. What we see here is hairy skin and glabrous skin. These nerve fibres have only been found in hairy skin. There's our gentle touch. There's the fast touch nerves coming in there. And here's the slow touch nerve. So you can see these two responses in these different classes of nerve fibres that dissociate between the fast touch, that's the conscious one you're aware of immediately, and the slow touch, which is the one that Importantly, when we get into the brain, it comes into the spinal cord. It goes up pathways that transmit information from these C-fibres. We don't exactly know where it's going in the spinal cord. We think it's going the same route as pain nerves and itch nerves, but we don't know. But that transmission process in the central nervous system involves a number of steps or relays where that signal is transmitted from one neuron to another as it moves up the spinal cord towards the brain. And we can see that information finally integrated into the central nervous system. This is just giving you some idea of the complexity of how neurons talk to each other and how signals are processed uh, in the peripheral and the central nervous system. So whizzing up the spinal cord, our signal from the C tactile afferent and the fast touch nerves come into the brain. And what we'll see here is a map of the brain represented in terms of the fast touch system, which is what's called the somatosensory cortex. So this is where your body is represented. Again, just the fast touch. The slow touch system we have finally discovered using, again, functional imaging techniques, doesn't come into this fast processing area of the brain. The slow touch system goes into areas of the brain that basically process emotion. So they're already they're dissociated. And these areas of the brain are where emotion is processed whereas the somatosensory cortex is, is where, where detection is processed. And again, using these techniques of functional magnetic resonance imaging, we can look at how the senses are represented in the brain, particularly the emotional aspects of those senses, and also, more importantly, how they interact. So touch interacts with smell, interacts with vision. We get into the multisensory element here as well, although I focus mainly on just one modality. And one key thing about this nerve fibre, by the way, the C tactile afferent, is that we have the only laboratory in the country that can record from this particular nerve fibre in human skin. And to understand its, its, its properties, uh, we have developed uh, many years ago a robot that would enable us to stroke the skin at different velocities and record from the nerve fibre so we can see how excited that nerve fibre is when we find one to affective gentle touch. And the first remarkable thing we discover there is that this nerve fibre is tuned. Yeah? When we look at the activity coming along that nerve fibre, the spike activity, i.e. these are the signals that go into the brain, that neuron is most active when it's been stroked at around about three centimetres per second. If you stroke faster or slower, the nerve fibre's activity rolls off. So this nerve fibre is tuned to the caressing touch. Now, if we just take our robot 
and ask people to rate how pleasant touch is when we stroke them at different velocities, we get exactly the same function. When we're stroking people at 30 centimetres per second or 0.1, they don't like it. When we hit that sweet spot, around 3 to 5 centimetres per second, people rate that as the most pleasant touch. So people's subjective reporting of the pleasantness of touch and the nerve fibre's response map perfectly. So we are tuned instinctively to caress and stroke each other's at this kind of velocity, which is the nerve fibre's response properties. So that's, that's where we've currently got in terms of understanding this nerve fibre's role in, in all aspects of our life, in fact. And I think across the lifespan. Uh, but our focus at the moment is getting down early interventions, looking at the impact of, an, of the... Yeah, what we'll look at in this study is obviously standard care babies and babies that get the mattress. And what we will really predict is that we'll see developmental indices from the babies that get the, that get the gentle touch stimulator compared to those that get standard care in terms of many indicators epigenetically. So we can measure the epigenetic consequences of early life uh, stresses on receptor systems in the brain that code for, let's say, for stress and for, and for serotonin. And what we will predict is that the babies that get the stroking are going to show much clearer indici- ind- indications that their brains are developing in a way which is, which is far more neurotypical. Because the one thing about these preterm babies is that 25% of them uh, will become autistic. Many of them will have some developmental cognitive um, uh, problems across their lifespan, but they're not getting touched. So if we're right, this will, be a, this will make a significant impact on neonatal intensive care units in the incubator, but also make a very clear point that this nerve fibre didn't evolve for no reason. This nerve fibre evolved particularly in early life to help the developing brain develop a very socially competent uh, way of interacting with, um, with, other, with others, other, other humans, of course. Uh, so no, I think this, this nerve fibre has yet to unfold the full narrative of how important it is across the lifespan. So in order to get at the possible role or potential role of touch during development, one of the best ways we found to do that was to look at where touch is most absent. And that's the idea that we came up with that the preterm infant, when it's removed from the comfort of the womb and placed in an incubator, Although all the medical care is looking at developing mechanisms to keep that baby physiologically alive, there's no touch going on. So in utero, the skin of the baby is being massaged by the amniotic fluid, it's rubbing against the the womb wall. Touch is a key element of that baby's life within the womb. And when that baby is removed to the incubator, there's a missing element. Now this is theoretical, but if we can prove that if we can put touch back we will make some significant improvements in the way that baby's brain develops and their immune system, by the way. We'll be able to test the theory that gentle touch is making some beneficial contribution to normal development. So what the mattress is doing under the control of this computerised system is it's basically giving a very gentle massaging touch to the baby that's lying on top of it. So we're replacing the environment to some extent that that baby was removed from when in the womb or the tactile environment. So this is now replicating that tactile environment. So the infant is now getting some form of gentle touch. So these nerve fibres are getting the activity that they were not getting when they were first placed in the incubator. And we will be doing some very sort of careful monitoring of physiological signs of the ability of this mattress to basically not harm the infant, but also to provide some benefits physiologically. And ultimately, uh, we will be measuring endocrinologically or epigenetically markers in the brain, in the, in the tissue fluids, that enable us to look at the methylation of various receptor systems in the brain that we know from animal work are actually implicated uh, by a lack of touch. But the first thing we're doing, obviously, we have Professor Mark Turner, the chief neonatologist here, who we're working very closely with, who's allowing us access to his babies and his NICUs, to first of all test in a human factor study that this mattress is safe. So the first part of this study, which we are hoping to start in the next couple of weeks, will enable us to look at term infants placed on the mattress, measuring some of their vital signs and making sure that there's no adverse impact of this gentle stroking. We don't envisage there is, but we need to do our due diligence. Once we've got through that stage, we've got large grants in place now to look at longer term 
strategy, where we will be start moving down into preterm infants. And ultimately, this mattress is, I think, ultimate developmental sort of window is very preterm infants. They're very preterm infants. They're so sensitive and gentle. Their skin is so sort of papery is that they can't be handled at all. So with the very preterm infant, we're hoping that this device will have its major effect right across that preterm neonatal uh, time period, which can be two to three months. This mattress will be giving the touch that's missing and we will be hopefully making some significant measurements that show that the babies that get the mattress, some indications of their development are, are, are more significantly changed for the positive than those who get standard care. We know the results very quickly because so much is happening so quickly in these babies that we get some very early indicators that our instrument, our, our mattress is making some changes. So that's the expectation and that we will be moving this <coughs> along in the next few years and ultimately to look at prospective studies. So that again, the babies that get these mattresses, we'd follow them through two, three, four, five years old and start looking at various cognitive markers. So the incubator has evolved over, over probably 100 years, I think, in terms of its, its development. And it's now an incredibly sophisticated instrument that is monitoring all of the aspects of, of health of that baby. The gases, the temperatures, everything is, is being replicated as much as possible to keep that infant alive. But if we're right with our hypothesis that, that the missing element is touch, this is the final component, if you like, that will be integrated into incubator design, which would go global. So the number of preterm infants born every year globally is about 15 million. So if we're looking at it from a market perspective, it's huge. If we look at it from a human perspective, it's also huge. So if this, if this mattress is playing the role that we are suggesting it plays, and remember, it's not just brain development, it's immune system as well, that this will have a positive impact on, on, on so many infants born well, worldwide. So although one of our focuses is looking at the neonatal intensive care unit and looking at putting touch back for these preterm infants in the incubator, the next stage in our study, which we are hoping to get off the ground soon, is looking at the impact of touch in, in school children. And again, school children have suffered enormously over the last couple of years because they haven't been able to play. And what happens when you're playing? You're touching each other. So we've worked with a wonderful lady called uh, Jean Barlow, who for 20 years has been implementing what she calls a peer-to-peer -to -peer touch program in local schools in Liverpool. And basically what happens here is that one, you know, one child will basically stroke the back of another and then the other child will reciprocate. Now Jean knew nothing about this nerve fibre, but she knew that these children, after they had this peer-to-peer -to -peer touch pro protocol, their behaviour changed enormously. Their attention increased, their, their, their agitation lowered. They were just, you know, they were very relaxed kids, but she had no idea of the mechanism. So nobody is picking up on the importance of peer-to-peer -to -peer touch. So what we're going to do now is to replicate a study that I actually carried out in, in Valparaiso, uh, where we looked at a population of rats. So it, basically, uh, I had a colleague down there who had stress models of rodents. He knew nothing about this nerve fibre, by the way, although he was a neurophysiologist. And I convinced uh, Alexis to take one group of rats out of their cage every day, and just stroke them at three centimetres per second or five centimetres per second for 10 minutes, okay? Another group of rats were lifted from the cage every day and they were stroked quickly. And another group of rats was, was a control. Now, over two weeks, they just had 10 minutes of touch every day. They were then subjected to what was called a chronic mild stress paradigm. So the smell of cats, lots of noise, you know, like a busy two weeks. At the end of that two weeks, these rats were put into some stress tests that were acute, uh, acute stress tests that you would have used to study the effect of an andiolytic, for example. So if you put a stressed rat in a, in, in a bath of water, it won't struggle to get out. If you put a stressed rat in an open field, it won't wander out into the middle territory. If you put a stressed rat on an elevated maze, it won't wander across it. If you put a stressed rat in a social situation, it will basically avoid it. Guess what? Those rats that had the five centimetres per second stroking aced all those tests they were basically behaving like a non-stressed rat. All they had was 10 minutes of touch. And we also measured cortisol or cortisone in the rat, which is a key marker of stress resilience. And again, what the five centimetres per second rats had was lower cortisol levels. That touch, just 10 minutes a day, had made those rodents resilient to all of these stress tests. So what we plan to do now is take that rat study into schools. 
So here we're going to do, replicate the, the rodent study, but now we'll be stroking children. And the idea is that each child will get this reciprocal touch. They will be touched either slow or fast. In two different schools and two different groups, we'll take salivary cortisol. And what we're hypothesizing is that those children that got the, the three to five centimeters per second stroking will be far more resilient when we give them a maths, a maths test or something at the end of the week. This is critical. If we're right, this is one of the most important sort of behaviours which should be implemented in every single school in this country. When I was a kid, we had free school milk. Because after the Second World War, there was a problem with nutrition. So the government provided every school in the country with free school milk. I think this touch paradigm is the new free school milk. It's now nutrition for the brain and not for the body as the free school milk was. And so hopefully, uh, watch this space and we'll have another piece of evidence demonstrating how important this nerve fibre is you know, for, for development.